Today we're going to learn how to use the channel wrangle node to move the Houdini rubber toy. So to start, let's create a geometry node and rename it toy. And we're going to go inside and create the famous test geometry or called rubber toy. So let me rotate it so it's peeking to the right side of the screen and come up here and I'd like to see a, a little bit of wire shading. It's just, it's reassuring. So right now we're in the technical desktop and we won't need most of these panels. So let's start by minimizing all the tools that we won't be using. We will not be using the tree view or the shelf tools. And for now we won't be using the Python shell. All we're left with is the scene view, our network editor, and the panel here with the parameters. So now that we have our geometry, let's start by moving the toy forward. And if you look at the axis in the lower left-hand uh, corner of the scene view, you'll see that we want to move the toy in the positive Z direction. Now normally you could come over and do this using parameter expressions or setting keyframes, but we're gonna do this using chops today. So we start by creating a chop network. Notice the chop network does not have any inputs or outputs. This is just a container for your channel operators or chops. And I'm just gonna rename this motion. So let's dive inside and move this toy. The first thing we'd like to do is create a data channel or just a channel. As a reminder, a channel is just a sequence of numbers. And when you're dealing with motion at 24 frames per second, your channel may have 24 numbers per second. If you're working with audio, then you may have 48,000 numbers per second. If you're recording or working with audio, that's 48 kilohertz. So with the channel node, if you mouse over it and click the information flag, you'll see by default it has one channel and because this is a 10 second sequence, there should be 240 numbers or 240 samples, which we see here. But what I'm looking at is the name of this channel, is Chan1. It's a generic name, so let's name this something more meaningful. If you come down to the parameter panel here, you will see the name used by default, Chan1. And let's name this P for position. Now, if you come back and click the information flag, you will see, whoop, the name of the channel is P for position. So to see what numbers are in this channel, you use the motion FX view tab. And you also have to turn on the display flag by default. I'm not sure why it's off by default, but what can you do? So here you can see there is a channel named P. It looks like it's just zero by default. That kind of makes sense. We haven't put any data into this channel yet, and you would expect it to default to zero but we think there should be 240 numbers there. If you come back and once again, look at the information for this, it says there are 240 samples. But if you look, you'll see there's one dot here at the beginning and one dot here at the end. So how can we be sure there's actually 240 samples? If you come up to the options, click on dots. This actually displays a little dot for every number or every sample in this channel P. This is a good way to do a sanity check to make sure that there's as many numbers and that you would expect. Another thing I like to do is to turn on the frame indicator. And by the way, whenever you mouse over this, notice here the keyboard shortcut is listed afterwards. That's T. Over here, the dots keyboard shortcut is D. And another useful one is grid low for G. So let's turn on the frame indicator T. Now, as we scroll and scrub back and forth through the sequence, we have a nice indicator. Also, if you click D on and off, you can show and hide the dots. And then lastly, if you hit G, it toggles through different degrees of granularity of grid lines. So you, it gives you more and more grid lines before it kind of circles back. Okay, with that in mind, we're now going to use the channel wrangle node. I'm gonna go full screen with the network editor and the keyboard shortcut for that is Control B. Let's wire this into a channel wrangle node or chop since we are dealing with channel operators. Like other wrangle nodes, what this allows you to do is use VEX in your operations. And VEX is so much faster than using Python or the older H script. But before we can use this, I wanna show you the most important button on the screen right now is select the wrangle node, come up and click the question mark. This brings up the help page for this node. And 
I find that until you've kind of mastered a node, there's just so many operators in Houdini, you want to become really comfortable with the help documentation. And here is the key thing about channel wrangle nodes. Well, there's multiple key things, but what I'd like to talk about today is what global variables are available to you. These are the variables that are immediately given to you inside the wrangle node. And notice they're all read only, except for the first one, V. And the V is the value of the current sample. So the idea is to populate your channels with numbers, you need to assign values to V. To do that, you'll need several things. One, uh, you'll want to know what time it is in the animation sequence, or you may want to look at what frame it is. And they have various variables for that, very various globals for that. Most often you'll use T. That just gives you the time as a float in seconds. They also give you several variables for accessing the frame numbers. And then lastly, they give you the ability to look at what channel you're looking at. Right now we have only one channel, but if we return to our channel node, the one that created a channel, we created just P for position. But you can create lots of other channels in this single chop. So you could do A, B, C, D. That gives us five channels named P, A, B, C, D. Click on the information flag and you can confirm there are five channels. Each one has 240 numbers and here are their names, P, A, B, C, D. So now when you come back to the channel wrangle, all five channels are handed off to this channel wrangle node. Returning to the help page, that's why you'll often want to be able to access a specific channel. So you have time data, frame data, channel data, and a few additional ones here. But the main one we'll be focusing on is computing numbers and assigning it to V. So let's get rid of these A, B, C, D channels. We're not going to use those. Right now we just want to compute the position. And we want to move the toy in the positive Z direction. So that means the value of the P channel, we'd like it to be some function of T. To keep things simple, let's take 2 times T. And in VEX, don't forget you always have to end in a semicolon. Let's exit full screen by doing Control B again. And up here, if you hit H, it'll just kind of zoom so you have a nice view of your network. Let's display the channel wrangle and turn off the channel one. Now, if you come back and look at the motion FX view, you'll see a line kind of shooting off here. We need to kind of resize the size of this graph. The way you do that is just click the home button and it'll do a nice resize for you. So here we see that we have Z is just a nice steady upward increase in value. Here there's a label P in the very teeny tiny font. I have not been able to find a way to increase this font. If anyone knows, let me know. That would be, that would be nice. Now let's come back to the scene view. Okay, we have the toy. We have the data. Now we need to connect the two. And you do that using an export node. Come down here and do an export. This allows you to take the data inside a channel and assign it to some other object in your project. In this case, what we want to do is take the P channel here and assign it to the TZ value here. Let's come up here and look at our toy. We have all these different parameters that you can use to control it. You can translate it, which is position, rotate it, scale it, pivot, and so forth. And if you mouse over and just wait, it'll give you the variable names for all the parameters. Here the parameters are TX, TY, TZ, T for translate. Let's jump into our chop network here and say we would like to export channel P to the node toy, and we would like the numbers to be assigned to the TZ parameter. Now if we come up, hitting you, and reposition our toy, and play back, okay, nothing happens. Also it's in playback as fast as it can mode. Let's play it back in real time mode. Nothing's happening. So what mistake did we make? It's not really a mistake. What you need to do is you need to turn on the export flag. Until you do that, it actually won't copy over the numbers from the export chop to wherever you want to copy it to. So let's turn on the export flag, come back up, and look what's changed. There's now that little green clock here to indicate that there is motion, time-dependent data go changes. Now if we play it back, 
our rubber toy slides along the positive z-axis. Now that's great. Let's take and add a little more complicated motion to this. Why don't we get it to kind of rotate in a helical way as it's progressing down the z-axis? So we're gonna dive back into our chop. Let's zoom out a little bit. And we need to make a few more channels to make that happen. So right now we're only controlling the tz parameter. We also want to control the tx and ty uh, values as well. So let's go full screen. Control B, H to zoom, come up to the channel chop and say what we'd like to do is we're gonna make values for X, Y, and Z. Not just one position value, we're actually gonna have three coordinates. So we're changing the name and making three more channels. You can confirm that by once again, I flag, information flag, three channels, X, Y, Z. Let's come into the wrangle chop. Right now we have a single expression, V equals two times T. The problem is which channel is this being assigned to? Well, let's take a look. Let's exit full screen mode, hit H to bring this back into focus and go to the motion FX view. And right now it's difficult to see the dark blue on black background. So if you click the channel wrangle node, come to common tab, you can change the color of the graph. And a bright yellow makes it easier to see. Here, X, Y, and Z coincide. They're overlapping one, with one another. It turns out that this VEX expression is given to all channels. So that's not what we want to do. What we want to do is assign the X value in one uh, bit of code, the Y value, and the Z value separately. So the z value, like we did before, is v equals two times t, but we have to be careful here. We have to check to make sure that we're on the z channel. How do you do that? Let's return to the help. You can refer to channels by either number or by name. The name is a string. The channel number is an index that starts as zero. You can do whatever you want, but I prefer the channel number because that way you can rename variables and not have to worry. So here, let's check to see if the channel number is two, and if it is, V will be two times T. The reason we did two is we start counting as zero with channel numbers. Now we need to assign a value to X and Y. So if for X, we're gonna check if the C channel number is zero, we're going to assign it the value, the channel value at time t to be sine of t. And for the y value, if channel number is one, the value will be cosine of t. By the way, I don't know if you caught that, but once you start typing in a function and do open parentheses, it gives you a little pop-up giving you um, usage information. Here, the key thing you'll want to notice is that this is the regular cosine function, but the input is in radians, not degrees. That's one difference where VEX is different than the typical user interface. The rotation values are in degrees. In VEX, it's in radians. So we now have three if blocks. For the first channel, which is the X channel, then it's sine of T. For the second channel, or index one, it's cosine. The third channel is what we used initially, two times t. Now, if you click off the little bit of code, you will see it will now update the graph. So we have the z channel data here, the x channel here, and the y channel here. By the way, whenever you want circular motion, that's what you use sine and cosine for. Sine and cosine look the same, they just kind of have different starting points. Sine starts here, let me zoom in. In the motion FX view, by the, by the way, there's a few shortcuts you want to know to be able to kind of like move it around. With your middle mouse button down, you can just kind of move this uh, graph paper around, if you will. If you right click, you can zoom vertically, horizontally, or both at the same time. So let's just zoom in and get a nice close look at X and Y. X is sine Z, Y is cosine Z. They're the same shape, they just are, one is shifted uh, a little bit, 90 degrees. And that's what you assign to values if ever you want to have circular motion in your animation. 
Let's hit the home button so that we can see all three channels again. Now let's come back to export. Initially we exported channel P to TZ and the problem is P does not exist anymore. I'm kind of curious what type of error message we'll get, if any. If we come back up here and hit play, nothing happens. And because there isn't a stopwatch icon here, we know that none of the parameters are being changed in any way. None of them are time dependent, I should say. So let's fix this. It's interesting that there's no visible error message. And in a way, we didn't do anything wrong. I mean, there might be a channel P, there may not be. And this says, well, if there is a channel P, we'll assign it to TZ. If not, that's fine too. So let's remove this. If you click the drop down, by the way, you'll see what channels are available to you. The star will map all of them, but I like to be explicit. X, Y, Z, we would like to assign that to T, X, T, Y, T, Z. Now we saw the toy jump. We go up a level by hitting U, and there's the stopwatch icon again. Let's see what happens. Okay. If we get a head-on view of this, you can see there's a very slow circular motion as it flies down the z-axis. We'll want to speed this up a bit. Let's dive back into our chop here. Full screen, H to zoom, channel angle. The way you can control how fast something rotates when you're dealing with circular motion is you multiply t by a number. The higher the number, the faster it will rotate. So what we're going to do is we're going to create a float called R for rotate and we'll give it, how about 2.5? We just want the circular motion to be 2.5 times faster than it was before. So we're gonna multiply the T by R and the same with cosine. You have to have the same argumentable sine and cosine to get circular motion. Now we come back to the scene view and let's see what it looks like. Okay, there we go. It's, it's a nice faster rotation. So we now have our toy moving in circular motion along the Z axis. And we did that using the channel wrangle node. By the way, look at the translate parameter of our toy. On the right here, there's this little orange strip. That is to let you know that this is under the control of a chop. And in fact, if you click on translate, you see it alternates between value and this useful message. This is saying the value of TX is overwritten by this chop and channel X. Because remember, a chop can contain multiple channels. So if you come over to the TZ parameter, it's overwritten by the export one chop and the channel that's being used is Z. You can always right click this, go to motion FX and say motion to FX and click on jump to motion FX network. When you do that, it will jump right to the chop network. And in fact, the exact chop node that is controlling that parameter. So it lets you know that the export one chop is the one that's controlling TZ. And it let you know that it was actually the Z channel. So there you go. That's a nice introduction to how you can use chops to control different parameters of geometry.